Prayer Platform is a private initiative supported by government and we're prepared to have a UAE Nigeria platform. I'm sure that there are some uh, informal platforms already, but we're happy to have that kind of platform and of course the government will be fully supportive of it. But because of the way that we uh, intend to approach this is to allow a natural, uh, is to allow these sorts of things to grow organically through the private sector. But once we have them, we are prepared to support them. The government, of course, will be very happy to support uh, any UAE, Nigeria uh, business or trading platforms that uh, exist. Now, the general procedures, and I, I, I think I can just, I'll probably just repeat this once or twice. Uh, we have what is called the Nigeria Investment Promotion uh, Council. Now, the NIPC is a one-stop shop for business facilitation generally. And one of the things that I'd want us to do is, and we have very, very, very highly competent individuals who work there, led by a lady called Yewande Sadiku, who herself used to be in the private sector and very high up in banking, and who is now the leader, uh, the, 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 the director general of the NIPC. So a lot of questions around what can we do to find good partners, what do we need to do to, uh, for, or what sort of issues we, you, you may have. Our NIPC, and we also have a website, the NIPC has a website, you know, Nigeria Investment Promotion Council also has a website. All of these sorts of questions uh, can be easily answered by, uh, by the NIPC. And I think that that's what will make the most sense. Because some of them, there are questions that you may want to ask, especially if you want to cross-check persons who you are doing business with. You know, there are times when you are not sure of the, of the sorts of individuals that you want to do business with. They are ready to help. In some cases, you are looking for specific things such as assistance with state governments. You know, for example, of course, as you know, as I said, we have 36 states in Nigeria. If you wanted to invest uh, outside of the federal capital territory, say you wanted to invest in Kaduna or you wanted to invest in Sokoto or somewhere, you will need some assistance with state governments. The NIPC is, you know, in a position to do all of the facilitations as required. One of the things we've tried to do is to work very closely with all the state governments. I chair what is called the uh, National Economic Council, which is a monthly meeting of uh, state governments. We held one just uh, on Thursday. All the state governors come together and I chair that meeting. So we're able to do a lot of uh, facilitation of businesses and all of that with the NIPC and all other regulators who are usually in attendance. Now, what are the procedures for guaranteeing investors and how do you reduce your risk? Well, generally speaking, investors are guaranteed by the existing legal framework. Our existing legal framework, including our constitution, does not allow expropriation of businesses. So there can be, government cannot take over businesses and cannot, uh, government cannot expropriate property. There, must, there, there is a due process. Constitutionally, you are not allowed to do so. What we, what we, and this is one of the reasons why I talked about the judiciary, especially in enforcement of contracts. With respect to enforcement of contracts, and we urge our, our investors to seek proper legal advice and draw up legal agreements that, that, of course, are binding under Nigerian law. Now, what we then do is to protect that as much as we can, to protect your agreements, protect legal agreements. Of course, sometimes legal procedures can be slow, but the truth of the matter is that under our law, under existing laws, we have adequate provision, both in commercial law. As I said a few minutes ago, we have a new Companies and Allied Matters Act, which takes into account most of the modern concerns or most of the current concerns that persons who are doing business, especially as corporate entities, may have. And we've tried to ensure that that particular legislation is one that is as forward-looking uh, as possible. So I think that, generally speaking, we have a legal system that works quite well. As I said, there are 
occasionally delays in, in the process, in legal process. Sometimes that takes a while. But the truth is that we have a legal system that works very well. And of course, it's based on uh, the traditions of English law, which most, uh, most investors are probably familiar with, especially those who do business in any of the Western countries. We also have, and one of the things that I, as a corporate uh, solicitor and, and corporate litigator at various times, would urge, is that in your agreement you have arbitration clauses or ADL clauses, alternative dispute resolution clauses, so that you are able to go outside the court system to resolve disputes that, uh, that there may be. And in many of the states, we now have alternative dispute uh, regulate, uh, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms where you can resolve disputes outside of the regular court system. Someone has talked about port congestion uh, and, and airports not functioning uh, in, uh, according to international standards or by international standards. Yes, there have been some problems with the ports in, in Lagos and in some senses it's a good problem because uh, there is an influx of uh, of, there's a great deal of trading activity. Now, in resolving that in the short term, you know, one of the reasons why I was slightly delayed in coming here is that we're trying to look at how, and this is also another business opportunity, we're developing inland ports and trying to ensure that we have inland ports in the various parts of Nigeria where goods can be undelivered. We are also at the moment building a new railway system, the Lagos Canal Rail, starting from their Papa ports, which we hope will be, we hope the Lagos Ibadan end of it, or the Lagos Ibadan part of it, starting from their Papa ports, will be completed by February this year. We had hoped it would be completed by March, but we, just, we, we found that there are difficulties, especially with, with um, the corridor, the, the, the rail corridor some encroachments on the rail corridor and settling some of the issues around those who are built in the rail corridor and ensuring that compensation is paid to them. That is causing some delays. So we expect that the rail route will take out a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, cargo from the ports outside of Lagos and that would also help uh, considerably in decongesting uh, the ports. We're working very actively also on all of the airports and all that. And for those who visit uh, quite frequently, you'll notice that there have been incremental changes, some of them uh, the visa on arrival procedure, some of them the clearing procedure and all of that. We're working also to ensure that those are, uh, attain uh, standards that are applicable anywhere in the world. As I pointed out in, in the course of my presentation, the major airports in Nigeria are being concessioned, and this is really, in my view, the long-term approach is the concessioning of those airports so that private sector can run them. My belief is that the private sector is a much more efficient, uh, is a much more efficient manager of facilities, a much more efficient manager of resources, and I think that this will be a very good thing for Nigeria. And again, it's an investment opportunity. That is the uh, the private the concession of the airports. Um, someone asked also, uh, what is the difference between the Nigeria that is projected in the media and the Nigeria I operate in? Well, I think generally speaking, when you look at how uh, a country is, is projected, it, a lot depends on where you're at. Uh, if you operate, for example, in, in, a, in any part of Nigeria, you probably will find that the news generally is not anywhere near what you might find in, you know, uh, in the media. The media naturally wants to highlight uh, bad news, which is, you know, I think that's just the stock in trade of this gentleman who is seated here. I mean, I think for who, who is interested in hearing that, oh, you know, nice things are happening in Sokoto State. Nobody wants to hear that. People want to hear that uh, a train crashed, you know, a plane fell out of the skies. Those are the kinds of things people want to hear. 
But I think that anybody who is functioning within a system, and I was speaking to one of our European ambassadors the other day about terrorism, and I said that there are countries, for example, where you know, school shootings alone, shooting kids in school alone, 22 in one month. I mean, if you, if you highlighted only that, you wouldn't even want to go to school there in that country of the world. But this is a huge country, and there's so many different things that are going on. And fortunately for us also, in many of with the areas where we have uh, the most challenging security problems, especially the herdsmen farmer clashes, are restricted. They're not, you know, the, the major issues are not spread across the country, which are some of the security challenges we have. Also, the Boko Haram crisis, which we believe is more or less resolved, except for some opportunistic attacks here and there. That is also in, in, you know, is a restricted area. It's not across the entire country. Nigeria, as you know, is a very huge country, very, very huge country. And most people who are in one part of the country, really, except for social media these days, probably don't even know what is going on in, in, in another part of the country. So I think that by and large, the sorts of challenges that we face are challenges that are faced you know, by many countries of the world. And sometimes those challenges are seasonal. You have some challenges that are, you know, that are seasonal, but you, we try to deal with them as they come. And we try to you know, also develop long-term strategies for dealing with them. But by and large, I'm sure that most people who have visited Nigeria or who do business in Nigeria will find that it is, generally speaking, a safe place to do business. And most businesses are, are unaffected by the major, by some of the things that we hear or see in the media. Commercial banks administering credit. Um, the, the whole issue around agriculture and credit for agriculture is one that we're working on uh, uh, very seriously. We have now the Bank of Agriculture, in the, new, in the current budget, we are capitalizing uh, the Bank of Agriculture, which we hope will be a more direct way of offering credit to commercial farmers. But we also want to push the commercial banks to give agricultural credit. You made, and it's an important point you've made, and we all accept the point, that generally speaking, commercial banks, except one or two, are not always, uh, they're, they're not always ready to give uh, credit for agriculture. And it's one of the reasons is because the commercial banks, by just putting their money in treasury bills, make substantial amounts of money. But now that, uh, the, that rates are coming down, they are now going to be forced to push out uh, credit and actually give credit. If you are making 17% on treasury bills, you are not likely to invest in any the real sector in any way including agriculture. But now that rates are coming down, it's becoming more obvious that they need to put out, uh, the, the, they need to, to give credit. And we've been also working with the central bank to ensure that NISA, I'm sure some of us are familiar with NISA, which is a credit, which there is uh, credit for agriculture, that NISA is given a much more prominent role to play so that working with the commercial banks, you can have lower, uh, you can have cheaper money for, for agriculture. So that, that, I think, is something that we're paying you know, uh, uh, great attention to. And I, and I think that for those who want to do some, uh, for those who want to do uh, business in agriculture, you might uh, well be able to find uh, credit. For many, you know, it's not just agriculture, the real sector generally, you know, if you don't have a track record of uh, business, it, many have said that there are difficulties with just accessing, uh, with accessing credit. But I think with what we're doing at the moment and with rates coming down, lending to the real sector will definitely <coughs> improve. Um, power sector roads and transportation. Let me just talk about the power sector very quickly, especially in relation to business. Of course, many of you would know, those who are familiar with the Nigerian business environment, know that we there was a power sector reform where uh, most, where the generation and distribution 
was privatized, and so we have uh, Genkos, we have generating companies that are private, we also have distribution companies that are private. Only transmission, the TCM, is government owned, is federal government owned. Now, we've had some difficulties with the discord, uh, that's distribution. Generating capacity is quite good. I mean, we've moved up, installed capacity in something in the order of about 15,000 megawatts of power. And there's so many new initiatives in solar and solar renewable energy generally. We don't really have a problem with generation. The problem is with the last mile delivering the distribution uh, and the last mile. And because the discos uh, have a great deal of difficulty because of their leveraging. The reform itself, when it was done from 2005 or so, did not really look in particular at, the, at, the, at how deep the pockets of a lot of the discos were. The discos find themselves in a situation where they simply don't have most of the resources that will be required to do, to invest more in metering, to invest in distribution assets, transformers, uh, transmission lines, etc. So they have, so the discos have a problem. Now, what we, how we try to resolve that is by saying, by doing what we call the eligible customer arrangement. Now, the declaration of eligible customer means that you can have a willing buyer, willing seller arrangement. And so you can go outside the discos. And if anyone who's followed some of the news on the power sector recently, will find that what we're doing now is that we are actually allowing uh, generating companies to supply power directly to industrial clusters, including markets, going outside what the discos, uh, going outside the discos. So if a disco that occupies a particular territory is unable to deliver power, what we've done is that by the eligible customer arrangement, it is possible for a company, for a company that's generating power, either to a cluster or from the grid, to sell power, especially to industrial, uh, to, to, uh, especially to industrial concerns and all that. We find that that has worked quite well, although the discos, of course, are unhappy about it, but there is no exclusive jurisdiction. They don't have exclusive jurisdiction. Um, they are unable to provide, uh, where they are unable to provide uh, power, we work on the uh, eligible customer or the willing buyer, willing seller arrangement. At the moment, we've done that for quite a few economic clusters, and we intend to continue to do so. Because really, the strategy for us is that you cannot rely entirely on power coming from the grid. So a lot of off-grid power is what we're investing in now. So there are several you know, small companies that are able to produce uh, either, in some cases, solar, in some cases, uh, uh, in, in some cases, thermal capacity and um, fuel uh, uh, IPPs to provide power across uh, across the country in different in the different economic clusters. So that I think is the solution. But I, I, I very strongly believe that with what we are doing at the moment, we will be able to deal with large portions of the power sector. Of course, I don't want to take you through all of the you know the economics of the whole value chain and all of that. But I think that with what is being done at the moment, we can really make significant improvement in power delivery, especially to the commercial clusters. Um, policies to encourage startups. Several, we have several policies to encourage uh, startups and uh, many of uh, those policies revolve around the Bank of Industry. The Bank of Industry has a new uh, fund specifically devoted to startups. The government also has been supporting startups directly. Uh, recently, we set up what is called the technical, uh, the advisory group on technology and creativity, which is really, you know, uh, a group of, uh, a, a group consisting of startups, uh, several owners of startups and owners of businesses in technology and entertainment. And I chair that particular advisory group. I've been working a lot on developing policy for the startups. The policies include access to credit and all that. And that really is from my own office. And so we, there's so many. In fact, just recently, just last uh, week, I believe it was, or barely 10 days ago or so, 
We were in uh, Silicon Valley with a group of startups talking directly to investors and so many investment uh, decisions were made right there and then. I think that there's enough room for startups that we are encouraging that through the Bank of Industry, through CBN funding, and um, we're also encouraging um, venture capitalists to invest in, in our startups. And that is, uh, in that respect, we're doing very well. In fact, just recently, we launched uh, what is called the Students' Challenge, where universities across the country are competing for funds for their own startups and all that. And um, this is all, this is mostly government supported with, with some private sector participation. So I think generally speaking, uh, startups uh, have very, very good opportunities. Uh, somebody asked about elections and trade, uh, what, how the 2019 elections will, may, or, may affect trade and investment. I, I don't think it will be significant at all. There, and the simple reason is that the policies that are in place are, you know, legal, they are in a legal framework. Uh, we cannot afford a situation where an election cycle in any way, uh, uh, in, in any way affects or impugns an investment. And that's why all of uh, the investments, all of the investment initiatives are backed by law or by executive order so that uh, nothing really changes uh, if, however an election, uh, an election cycle plays out. So I don't think that that will be a significant, I don't think that will be a significant problem. Except of course if you are investing in the politicians, you know, if you are not investing in the politicians, you should be just fine. Raising the value of, uh, you know, I think we've talked about that. Uh, somebody talked about congestion, of traffic in Lagos, you know. Well, Lagos, I think, has improved considerably. Like most uh, mega cities, uh, New York, uh, Bangkok, and several cities, you have uh, traffic challenges. I think that what has happened in Lagos is that there, are, of course, as you know, there are new road initiatives at the Fourth Mainland Bridge which again is a major investment uh, opportunity, although I know that there are several takers now. So there are, it's a continuous uh, uh, thing being done. Uh, we're looking at how in various ways, especially where federal roads are concerned, how we can concession those federal roads over or hand them to the state government. We recently handed over the airport road, the road leading from Lagos Airport out to uh, Oshodi and all of those areas, to the Lagos State Government <clears throat> to enable them to uh, develop uh, that facility and toll it if they wish. So I think that building more roads and uh, also uh, managing the traffic is the only way to go. We, we don't involve ourselves in managing traffic in the states because that's a state function. But I believe that with Lagos, you know, as with any very busy capital city. The traffic cycles are also fairly determined unless, uh, of course, there is a major, there's a major problem. Otherwise, most people who live or work in Lagos have somehow you know, managed to look at the cycles, you know, when the, you know when the rush hour is and you know when things are lighter. Um, challenging administrative decisions in courts, yes, that's very, that's, that's, that's always available. Uh, and I, just as you said, as a lawyer, I have seen or been part of several challenges of administrative decisions. And the courts have very frequently ruled in favor of, of the challenges of administrative decisions. I don't think that there's a problem uh, whatsoever with that. Although what we've also tried to do, especially with investments, is to create opportunities for investors to uh, arbitrate those disputes and in some cases by going up to the NIPC or some other regulatory authority we try to work out if these are decisions that can be sorted out especially for and this is what I was talking about when I talked about the labs that we held where administrative bottlenecks disturb an investment you know with, and in this lab structure we bring together all of the uh, regulatory authorities, investors, 
and try and get them into a room to work out whatever administrative difficulties there are. And this lab structure has worked very effectively because we make sure that all the major regulators are there in the room. And as I said, I also participate in uh, some of the sessions of the labs. Um, local content, I think uh, already uh, we've done a lot of work with local content. There are two executive orders specifically directed at local content, saying that uh, in procurements, whether it's procurement of goods or services, local content must be prioritized. Executive order three, I believe it is, and five. Uh, orders aside from uh, local content in oil and gas, which is regulated by existing legislation. So there is uh, ample provision for that. Logistics and freight forwarding, there is a lot of activity around that now, especially logistics. And just recently, I know that Mask, uh, the shipping company and logistics company, working with the, uh, with the, seat, with the, um, uh, with, I'm trying to remember the particular body that they're working with, one of the uh, World Bank, one of the World Bank groups, have come and they're looking at logistics, especially with, agro, with, with the agro-allied industry. They're looking at how to deal with logistics, bringing farm products from farm to the table. And there's a fair amount of work going on in that respect. And Mask, as you know, is one of the major logistic companies uh, in the world. And they are investing heavily in logistics. So they are those who are interested in logistics uh, and all of that. But also, I think, is a good business opportunity. And of course, where you see some of the big names going into it clearly, that must tell you something about the prospect. Uh, somebody asked why only Lagos and Kano were mentioned in the presentation. That's not correct. I mentioned uh, several other cities. I mentioned Ibadan, Port Harcourt, several cities, especially with respect to location of businesses. When I was talking about malls, I talked about those cities. But the reason why I mentioned Lagos and Kano in particular is because in implementing, now these are the two, these are two major commercial centers. Port Harcourt is another, but in terms of commerce, in terms of just trading, Lagos and Kano are the top two. And what we tried to do was to, because so many businesses go to those two locations, we tried to implement some of the reforms in those two locations first. Of course, we're implementing the reforms across the country, but in Lagos and Kano, we want to implement those reforms there first, because that's where you find, you know, that several uh, businesses tend to go, especially uh, some of the companies that have come into the country for various reasons. As, uh, outside of oil and gas, most of the non-oil uh, investments have tended to go in that direction. Um, if somebody asked about estimated billing, when will that stop and all of that? Well, this is the point we're making and this is why uh, the discos, as we've said, lacked, uh, many of them lack the capacity because they simply don't have the investments to be able to do the billing and metering and all that. And that's why we're doing the willing buyer, willing seller option. But we think that with some of the fresh investments we expect will go into discos and uh, in the next couple of months, we expect that some fresh investments will come there. We, we think that, that, and we also have a metering plan. Uh, there's a major uh, metering plan. W what we're trying to do with metering is to take it completely outside of the discos and to allow independent companies to meter and to charge for their own metering. So that particular metering plan is one that we intend to pursue. I think uh, we should start operations by end of September, I believe it is, to begin uh, the independent companies doing metering. Once that is done, you wouldn't have any estimated billing because uh, meters will be available for all consumers. Somebody asked about young Nigerians in government. Uh, there are several young Nigerians in government, several. I work with, uh, in fact, practically everybody who works with me is under 40. My advisors, my uh, assistants, technical advisors, almost all of them are under 40. So there are several young Nigerians in government. Question, of course, is that, you know, if, 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 if you're looking for a 30-year-old minister of finance and all of that. Yeah, it could come, you know. Those sorts of things happen. 
but there are rarities. You don't have a Macron everywhere in the world, you know. Every once in a while you get a Macron, but it's, it's, not, it's not the norm. Generally speaking, a bit of experience is also required. In order to be able to deliver effectively, I think that one needs a bit of experience. And what has happened, you know, what, what I think is good is that young people who want to be in government start, you know, as advisors, assistants, special assistants, and those kinds of things, or work in the bureaucracy. And several of them are exposed <clears throat> to government and the way that business is done in government. Several of them, of course, are the experts that we rely on. But a certain amount of, you know, experience is also garnered by just being there, seeing things being done, interacting with politicians, with bureaucrats, and all of that. It's not just about being smart, you know. I mean, government is not just being clever, it's not just being smart. You have to deal with politicians, deal with bureaucrats, deal with all sorts of tensions, sometimes ethnic, sometimes religious. So I think that a bit of, uh, I think working with government is a, uh, in those capacities is always a good thing, always a good training ground. But there is nothing, there is not, nothing whatsoever that stops a young person from aspiring to any positions in government that they may please. Uh, there are no special, um, there are no special uh, things for foreign graduates. We welcome everyone, and many foreign graduates are back home working. I, I have a very substantial number of foreign graduates who work with me. Many Nigerians are also foreign graduates. In fact, practically every Nigerian goes to school in Nigeria and abroad. So, I mean, we welcome all of you. But we don't have any special provisions for, uh, for foreign graduates. Anyone who wants to come home, of course, is, is very, very welcome. Um, the, a company asked about concessions for investing in uh, CCTV. One of the major things is that if you start a company, if you're, if you're starting a company, and if you look at our compendium of incentives, which I just referred to, is also available on the NIPC website. You most likely are eligible for what is called the pioneer status, which enables you to have five years at least of free, uh, tax free, five uh, tax free years. So you're not paying tax for the first five years. So if you come and establish your business, you're most likely going to be entitled to no corporation tax, etc., for the first uh, five years. And also, importation, you can wholly own your business, even as a foreigner. You can repatriate 100% of your capital. You can engage who you like to work, so long as they are technic technical people, you can engage them to work. So the, the concessions uh, or incentives are all there. Um, I think somebody asked how soon for Nigeria Air. Well, we've only just announced, and uh, we're also looking at the business case. There are several different investment issues around it. There is a determination to ensure that I said is private sector led, and we have several, you know, interested persons who are looking at it. I would say that, you know, uh, within a 12 to 18 month period, we should expect, you know, uh, actual uh, takeoff if uh, if things go in the normal course that we expect them to go. But it's not uh, it's not starting tomorrow, you know because obviously there are many uh, st things that need to be done. I think that's about most of the questions that were asked. I think I've, yes? Anything about sports? I think there's a question about sports, you know, and um, I, I'm not, um, I, except if there's a specific uh, uh, thing on sports, what we've tried, I mean, they, just as with every aspect of Nigerian life and business, entertainment, uh, we, as I said, we have the advisory group on technology and, and, and creativity, beg your pardon. So anyone who is interested in business in any of those areas, uh, we probably will function within that, that context. But, Every aspect of Nigerian uh, of, uh, of Nigerian life is, is open for business. If you want to invest in sports, 
depending on what it is or what the specifics are. I'm sure that these are areas that we can look at. Thank you. Thank you.